Welcome to this eighth webinar in our Countdown to the UPC series at Taylor Wessing, and thank you very much for joining us. Just a couple of housekeeping points before I get started. You can send us uh, questions by email, which we will try to answer during the webinar, but otherwise we'll get in touch with you afterwards, so please do send those in. And please also hang on to the very end of the webinar uh, for a quick, a very quick survey, which we'd be very, very grateful if you would um, fill in to give us feedback. So, it's now t nearly 10 years since the European Commission decided, after decades of setbacks, that it would again relaunch the project for a pan-European patent system. The results, as we now know, of course, will be a single system centred on a unified patent court and a unitary patent. The court is, or will be when it's ratified, established by the unified patent court agreement. But this agreement doesn't provide details of the powers and procedures that will be required for the UPC to oversee and hear actions day to day. For this reason, a committee of experienced practitioners and judges was established to draft the rules of procedure, and it's these, after four years of work of their own, and 17, no less than 17 earlier drafts, that yielded the rules of procedure that were approved on the 19th of October 2015, and which, it should be remembered, are still being called the 18th draft, but are substantially the rules that will govern the court when it opens. So having covered a number of issues about the court, such as its context in the overall European patent system, its structure, competence, and its jurisdictional rules for infringement and revocation claims, we now want to step back a little in this webinar and look at the procedure of the UPC in overview, from filing through to damages and costs, and also to examine the fees for using it, as well as a, a short introduction to some of the evidential procedures. So my name is Paul England, and I'm pleased to say that I'm joined by my colleagues Corinne Shannon, who is a partner in our Eindhoven office, and Christoph Herner, who is a partner in our Dusseldorf office. But before we tackle the subjects I've just described, I should update you about developments on the preparation of the UPC since our last webinar. So firstly, the recruitment of legally qualified and of technically qualified judges at the court has now been launched, that's for first instance and court of appeal, that's been launched with the publication of vacancy notices and an application process. And this process will encompass a recruitment of both part-time and full-time judges to the court. But it's still not clear yet when the recruited judges resulting from this process will actually be decided and named, although potential users of the system will no doubt be keen to see some familiar names um, amongst those, amongst that number, in order to boost their confidence in the decision-making quality of the court. We also don't know if any of those judges will be from the UK at the moment, and the reason for that, of course, is that it would all seem to depend on the result of the UK referendum on membership of the EU, which takes place this, uh, next Thursday, 23rd of June, so exactly one week away. If there is a vote in favour of Brexit, we'll discuss the likely effect of this in our next webinar. But for now, I'll just say that the EPC agreement has just received its tenth ratification from Bulgaria, meaning that only a ratification, a ratification from the UK, uh, Germany, <coughs> Germany, and one other member state is now required to bring it, uh, the EPC into force. So with that, let's turn to the substance of this webinar, starting with the subject of fees. And for this, I'm going to turn to Christoph Herner in Dusseldorf. Christoph. Yes, thank you very much, Paul. So I will introduce you to court fees. So at its meeting on February 25th, 2016, the preparatory committee agreed on court fees and, as we will see a little later in this webinar, also on recoverable costs for the UPC. Both of these um, decisions will be incorporated into the rules of procedure. Um, the starting point for costs are court fees in accordance with Article 36.3 of the UPC agreement um, is that these are divided into two different groups. So the first group is for actions that are subject to a fixed court fee plus an additional value-based fee. 
which applies if the case has an estimated value exceeding 500,000 euros. Actions in this group may include infringement actions and actions for declaration of non-infringement. Now the second group is in, are actions that are subject to only a fixed fee and no value-based fee. This category includes revocation actions and, in particular, important preliminary injunctions, but also matters such as preservation and inspection orders. Um, we will look at the details of these fees shortly, but first uh, we will have a look at the number of circumstances in which fees can be, court fees can be reimbursed or reduced. So, turning to the next slide, with regard to reimbursement, there are two possibilities. The first uh, possibility is a reimbursement of certain proportion of fees um, to reward early termination of the action by the parties. Now, the exact amount of um, reimbursement depends on what stage of the proceedings the proceedings were terminated. So, for instance, um, and a value of 60% will be reimbursed if a withdrawal of the action or settlement occurs before the conclusion of the written procedure. 40% would be reimbursed if the withdrawal or settlement occurs before the conclusion of the interim procedure, or 20% at a later stage if the withdrawal or settlement occurs before the conclusion of the oral proceedings. Now, the second possibility for reimbursement is that the parties to an action receive a reimbursement of 25% of the fees they've paid because the action is heard by only one judge. Now, this may, re may be requested by the parties to have just one judge hear the case rather than the common three-judge panel. However, one has to note that this uh, cannot be claimed in addition to reimbursement for withdrawal or settlement pointed out before. Instead, only the largest applicable reimbursement will apply. Then there's also a possibility of fee reduction from the outset of the action, which particularly relates to small enterprises. So fee reduction allows only 60% of the total fees due to be paid by small enterprises or so-called micro-enterprises. These are defined by criteria in the recommendation of the European Commission number 2003-361 of May 6, 2003. So if a party wants to benefit from either status, it must affirm that it fulfills these criteria in its statement of claim, counterclaim, or other relevant application when it is lodged with the registry. Furthermore, it is also possible for the parties to apply to the court for relief from court fees if the amount which they have to pay threaten their, threatens their economic existence. Now, of course, I mean, it's difficult to provide guidance on when the court will consider this threat to economic existence at the current stage. We will just have to wait for first case law on this. Now we will turn to slide four, and we will have an actual look at uh, the fees that accrue, court fees. Now, we have not um, in this slide um, shown the full table of fee values because uh, that would be exceeding. We've just provided an illustrative section of values um, that can illustrate the range which is applicable here. So, as we can see, at the top cases that value of 500,000 or less, only the fixed fee applies, which is 11,000 euros. For all cases valued above 500,000 euros, there's an additional value-based fee. The value-based fees on the scale according to the case value up to a cap of 325,000 euros for actions valued at more than 50 million euros. Although it has to be remembered that, of course, the fixed fee also has to be added, so there's a total ceiling of a max of 336,000 euros of court fees. Of course, you also have to remember that this is only for first instance, so when it goes on appeal, the same if court fees will apply, so in other words, the fees will double. Turning now to the next slide and revocation actions and fees, the, first of all, the general rule applies that a separate uh, revocation action um, is only subject to a fixed fee of 20,000 euros. However, if the uh, revocation action is lodged by way of a counterclaim, the fee will be calculated on the same basis as the infringement action up to a cap of 20,000 euros. So this is the maximum also for a counterclaim for revocation. For counterclaims to smaller value actions, the fees for the counterclaim would therefore be less than 20,000 euros. 
Um, then, of course, it has to be remembered that other procedures and measures of the court will incur their own fixed fees. For example, this was already mentioned, preliminary injunctions, only the fixed fee of 11,000 euros applies. Um, the fee for an application to preserve evidence is 350 euros, and the fee for, for filing a protective letter is 200 euros. Again, if it is possible to file a separate appeal against any of these, the same fees will accrue in the next instance. Now turning to the next slide, we've now talked about case values and of course there's a certain difficulty how to predict exactly what the value of a case will be. The current rules uh, do not provide any practical guidance in this regard. They just state that the relevant action must reflect the objective interest pursued by the filing party at the time of filing the action. Deciding on the value of the rules also state that the court may take into account the guidelines laid down in the decision of the administrative committee for this purpose. But this guideline is not available as of yet. So coming from Germany and the value-based uh, system, I can perhaps provide some insight in, in how this is handled in Germany, um, while it has to be said in the beginning that this is a science uh, in itself. So when a plaintiff uh, in Germany decides to bring an action which is uh, for which a value-based court fee accrues, um, several factors play a role for, for assessing this value. This is, uh, first of all, the remaining term of the patent at the time of filing the action, then sales figure, size, and market position of the plaintiff, then the nature, extent, and detrimental effects of the infringing acts, and the intensity of risk of commission and repetition. Of course, what has to be noted is that the plaintiff, when filing his complaint, is not um, in a position to, to see any of the accounting to know about what, what actually happened and what the actual case value may be. So this is only more or less a guessing game. In the end, the court will have to decide it. Um, what is, however, a more straightforward way to, to calculate, for instance, the value of an injunction is um, if it is possible to find out the sales the the sales protected by the patent per year, so roughly how many products would have been sold that fall under the patent, uh, times a reasonable royalty for the patent, and then times the lifetime of the patent forward going. So this is the value of the injunction, and then as a rule of thumb, of course, it depends um, how much lifetime is left in the patent. The injunction part makes up maybe 70% of an action, so it is possible to, to calculate a value of the matter. Um, what has to be noted is that this can never be exact. In the end, it will be a, a rule of thumb uh, that the court will just apply um, and it will come to a round number, but um, this does provide some guidance, especially when, when calculating court fees before starting an action and assessing potential cost risk also for um, in case the, the proceedings are lost. Then. Now we discuss the infringement actions. Of course, we have to look at revocation actions. And revocation actions, are, of course, uh, they don't just concern uh, one party. They consider, uh, concern the public at large that would be subject to the patent. So the German approach in this regard of the German Federal Court of Justice is uh, that um, the value of the infringement action does not fully reflect the fair market value of the patent, which normally exceeds the interest of the revocation of the plaintiff. So in other words, something has to be added, and in recent jurisprudence it has been quite common to lift the um, fees that were subject to the infringement action to at least 25% in a corresponding nullity action. Um, although there are many parameters that allow for a transparent calculation, as we've just seen in slide 6 and 7, it will of course remain up to the uh, UPC to provide some, some clear guidance, and especially it has to be factored in that several countries are in this territory uh, which would be covered by the judgment, so a uniform approach would have to be developed because a plaintiff is, of course, not in the position to assess uh, the, the scope or risk of infringement for, for each country, and that's not in a position to provide a very detailed um, expectation of, of what the court or the costs would be. Okay, now we've looked at the court fees uh, in the UPC. Um, I will now hand over to my partner, Karine Shannon in Eindhoven, who will look at the procedures in more detail. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Christoph. Um, we're going to turn to slide eight um, regarding the actions in the UPC. Well, there are currently some 380 rules spread over 140 pages in the rules of procedure that were agreed on the 19th of October, which, uh, as Paul said, are officially labeled the 18th draft. So the rules are quite complex. However, at their most basic, they are structured according to three causes of action. First of all, infringement. Secondly, revocation and thirdly, non-infringement, including the possibility of counterclaims and claim amendments. There are also a number of actions and defenses for which the UPC has exclusive jurisdiction. And these are counterclaims for licenses, actions for provisional and protective measures, declarations of invalidity of supplementary protection certificates, damages or compensation derived from the provisional protection, use of invention prior to grant of the patent or the right based on prior use, and actions for compensation for licenses of rights. Those actions must be brought before the court using these same rules. Furthermore, there is a unique procedure by which actions of the EPO when administering the unitary status of patents may be reviewed. And all of these actions share in common that they are divided into up to five stages at first instance. First, there is a written procedure, then there's an interim procedure, an oral procedure, a procedure for obtaining damages, and a procedure for obtaining costs. There is also an appeal procedure for decisions on the merits and interim decisions made by the court. The subject of appeal is outside the scope of this webinar, except to note that an appeal will automatically suspend a decision to revoke a patent, but has no sus suspensive effect on infringement decisions, including preliminary injunctions, unless the court decides otherwise upon a request for suspension. So as regards the first instance proceedings, it is intended that the first three stages, so that are the written, interim, and oral proceedings, will conclude in a written decision on the merits in each case within one year of the action being launched. However, there is a Currently, no guidance on how long appeals of decisions on the merits and interim matters will take. So let's look at the stages of proceedings in a little more detail on the slide, which represents an infringement action up to, an, up to and including the oral hearing in the one-year time frame. Much of the speed of proceedings that is hoped for in this UPC is owed to the time period set for the exchange of written pleadings during the written procedure. The time period for responses begins at three months for a defense and comes down to one month for any further pleading after a rejoinder for a reply. However, these time periods can be and may have to be extended in some cases. This is because the statement of claim, defense, counterclaim, reply, and other pleadings must contain substantive details of a party's case, requiring a great deal of upfront preparation. In particular, pleadings will require all of the following. The facts relied on, such as details of at least one instance of alleged infringement, available evidence relied on or an indication of it, and an explanation of why the facts stated constitute an infringement or, for the purpose of a revocation action, one or more grounds of revocation. These documents must also include arguments of law and, where relevant, the claim interpretation relied on. Any order that the party lodging the statement will seek during the interim procedure must also be included at this early stage. Furthermore, a defense to either a statement for revocation or a counterclaim for revocation may also contain an application to amend the patent in dispute. Such an application must contain the amendments that are proposed, including one or more sets of auxiliary requests, and reasons why these meet the relevant requirements of the European Patent Convention. In practice, quite how quickly proceedings are conducted in a particular division is also likely to depend on the workload of the division in question and the complexity of the action. In particular, interim hearings may be needed if there is a preliminary objection to the statement of claim 
or a decision to transfer actions between divisions. Furthermore, the number and complexity of the decisions made during the interim procedure can be expected to vary from one case to another. The interim procedure generally begins after all the pleadings in the written procedure have been served. It is designed to enable the judge rapporteur to make preparations for the oral hearing and may require the judge rapporteur to hold one or more interim conferences for this purpose. In particular, the judge rapporteur may have to identify the issues and facts in disputes, may establish a schedule for further progress of the proceedings, he may have to issue orders regarding production of further pleadings and or evidence, or he may have to make any other decision or order as the judge rapporteur deems necessary for the preparation of the oral hearing, including an order for separate hearing of witnesses and experts. Even if an interim conference is unnecessary, the judge rapporteur may order the parties to answer specific questions, produce evidence, and lodge specific documents. In any case, the rules place the burden on the judge rapporteur to complete the interim procedure within three months of closure of the written procedure. The interim procedure is then followed by the oral procedure, which consists largely, largely of the oral hearing, at which the parties make their submissions to the panel of judges of the division, and experts and witnesses may give oral evidence. This is limited to one day in principle, and indeed, to help to contain hearings to this one day, the parties making submissions may have time limits imposed on them by the court. After the oral hearing has concluded, the presiding judge must then make a decision on the merits as soon as possible and in writing within six weeks. So if we then turn to the next slide, slide nine, on damages and costs. If the decision on the merits of the oral hearing holds that there is liability for infri infringement of a valid patent, the injured party may recover damages. Damages must be obtained by a further procedure that is started by lodging an application for the determination of damages no later than one year from the decision on the merits. And if there is an appeal pending on the merits, this application may be stayed until the appeal is decided. Note also that an interim award of damages may be ordered at the time of the decision following the oral procedure to cover at least the anticipated costs of the damages procedure. And as regards costs, the reasonable and proportionate legal costs and expenses of the successful party may be recovered from the unsuccessful party by use of a further procedure. The rules on court fees and recoverable costs also emphasize that the general rule on costs recovery by the successful party is subject to safeguards, and these include the ceiling on recoverable representation costs, which I shall come to in a moment, as well as the requirement that some such costs are reasonable and proportionate. And in particular, the rules on court fees say that equity may also serve as a self-standing ground for rendering the general rule inapplicable. And the rules on court fees also say that in case of partial success or in exceptional cir circumstances, the court may order the parties to bear their own costs or apply a different apportionment of costs based on equity. This appears to mean that the court may take an issue-based approach to awarding costs in those cases where one party has been unsuccessful overall, but nonetheless won on certain issues, and vice versa. An order for interim costs may also be obtained, as may an order for security for costs of a party, but an approach to the amounts and the circumstances in which these are granted remains to be developed by the judges. So let's now turn to the next slide, slide 10. So as I referred to a moment ago, the rules on court fees contain ceilings on recoverable costs of representation per instance and party based on the case value as one of a number of measures intended to ensure that re recoverable costs are reasonable and proportionate. 
And as shown in the table on this slide 10, which is again a selection from the full table, the scale of recoverable costs ranges from a ceiling of 38,000 euros for an action valued up to and including 250,000 euros to a ceiling of 2 million euros for actions valued at over 50 million euros. However, there is the possibility for the ceiling on recoverable costs of representation to be modified in certain circumstances. So first of all, the ceiling may be raised to a certain extent if, for example, the case is of particular complexity or multiple languages are used such that there is an impact on the costs of representation. Or the ceiling may be lowered, for example, if the economic existence of a party is threatened by the amount of costs of representation payable to the successful party. In particular, if the unsuccessful party is a micro-enterprise, small medium enterprise or non-profit organization, a university public research organization or a natural person. And there is no limit by which the ceiling may be lowered. That is all I would like to say about the structure of proceedings. So at this point, I'm going to hand back to Paul England in London to provide a high level look at the most important powers available to the new court. Thank you very much, Karine. Yes, so on slide 11, a significant aspect of the UPC will be how it manages the provisional powers provided in the rules of procedure. The most important of those are likely to be the preliminary injunction, which we looked at um, in detail back in part five of our webinar series, and also the preservation and inspection orders. These powers are particularly significant for the fact that applications of both can be heard ex parte, uh, without the defendant present in circumstances such as where delay is likely to cause irreparable harm to the applicant or in which there's a dis demonstrable risk of evidence being destroyed or otherwise ceasing to, be <coughs> ceasing to be available without the order. Although in both cases protective letters, which is a concept familiar to German and Dutch practice but not, not in uh, the English courts, may also be lodged in order to anticipate an application for the measure and make preemptive arguments against it. As I say, preliminary injunctions were dealt with in webinar part five, and I, I would urge you to listen to the recording of that webinar on our UBC, uh, UPC webinar pages. Uh, but just to recap on preliminary injunctions briefly, the award of a preliminary injunction is discretionary, and the court must take into account the balance of convenience when deciding to award one. That is, does the potential harm in granting the injunction outweigh the potential harm in not doing so for the parties? Although it's likely to be a factor in the exercise of this discretion, the UPC is not explicitly required to assess whether damages would be an adequate remedy instead of the injunction. It's also at the discretion of the court whether it requires reasonable evidence of the validity and infringement of the patent. So many trials on the merits are therefore perhaps unlikely to be needed when deciding this form of relief. However, uh, unreasonable delay in applying for the injunction uh, must be considered. The court may also require an applicant to provide a security as a condition of ordering the injunction in order to compensate the defendant should it later be held that the injunction should not have been granted. So on the slide 12, attaining evidence. How does a party obtain evidence to prove its case in the UPC, and where do preservation orders fit in? The first thing to say is that there is no form of general disclosure in the UPC of the kind found in common law systems. However, the rules of procedure do require the parties to indicate and produce evidence regarding, a quote, a statement of fact that is contested or likely to be contested. Now, the use of the word regarding by the rules here may imply that evidence that is both helpful and unhelpful to the party relying on a statement of fact must be produced by this, that party, but this remains to be clarified. The rules of procedure also provide for orders to produce evidence from an opponent and orders to communicate information. The former concerns the production of specified documents um, and or information 
for which the applicant has, in quotes, reasonably available and plausible evidence of existence. The latter, by contrast, is an order that an infringer informs the applicant of the origin and distribution channels of infringing goods, together with certain other information. A third party may also be ordered to produce this information in circumstances where they've been found in possession of infringing products, or they've been using an infringing process on a commercial scale, or providing services used for those activities. So in the next slide, we'll go on to preservation um, and uh, preservation seizure orders. Potentially the most significant evidence obtaining procedures available to parties in the UPC are those of preservation and inspection, which are familiar from French, German and Dutch practice, but uh, not so in the UK. Like other preliminary measures, these can be applied for before proceedings on the merits have been lodged. However, if an action on the merits is not brought within 31 calendar days or 20 working days of the preliminary order, it will be revoked. Applications for these measures may also be heard ex parte and may be subject to the provision of the security too. So what measures can be obtained to preserve evidence exactly? Well, the court may in particular order detailed description of the allegedly infringing goods, with or without taking samples of them, or physical seizure of allegedly infringing goods, uh, physical seizure of materials and implements used in the production and or distribution of those goods. Um, and it may also order um, that related documents or digital media and data can also be seized. So given the potentially draconian effect of preservation and or inspection orders, it's going to be particularly important to see how the court exercises its discretion to award these measures. And this is something that will be watched particularly closely after the court opens. So in the next slide, other forms of evidence. One of the most important forms of evidence in patent cases is usually expert opinion evidence, and this is likely to remain so in the UPC. Witness statements on issues of fact are also permitted, as is the conduct of experiments in the UPC to prove a statement of fact. For example, to show that a product has properties that fall within the patent claims being enforced. The rules of procedure adopt the English law tradition that when adducing the results of experiments conducted for proceedings, any previous attempts to carry out a similar experiment must also be disclosed. And this is to guard against cherry picking, in inverted commas, the most, uh, that is taking the most favorable results obtained from one or more um, attempts and leaving the less successful results to be undisclosed. The experiment can also be, um, may also have to be repeated in the presence of the opposing party in some circumstances. So on the next slide, experts. Evident expert, um, expert evidence can be brought in two ways, by an expert who has been appointed by the court or by experts appointed separately by each of the parties. At the oral hearing, experts and witnesses, for that matter, are heard on issues earlier identified by the judge or rapporteur in the interim procedure. They may also be questioned by the parties under the control of the court and by the court itself. However, the extensive testing of oral evidence by cross-examination, which is central to common law trials, won't be a feature of oral hearings in the UPC, although it is possible that small amounts of cross-examination on narrow issues may still be seen. The court expert is also open to questions from the court and parties at a hearing. If an expert is court appointed, the parties can also be heard on the expertise, independence and impartiality of that expert before they're used. Furthermore, and importantly, although the parties may appoint their own expert, such experts are not to be, in inverted commas, hired guns, that is an advocate for the party hiring them. Instead, the expert has got to be objective and has a duty to assist the court impartially on matters relevant to their area of expertise, and that duty overrides any duty to the appointing party, the party that's appointing them um, and paying them. Issues of the preparation and use of evidence in UPC proceedings will be closely intertwined with rules on privilege. In particular, the rules of procedure have adopted the basic principle of litigation privilege from English law. 
This applies to protect uh, from production to the opposing party those confidential communications with experts made for the purpose of obtaining information or evidence, the purpose or use in proceedings. However, the precise application and scope of this principle remains to be worked out by the UPC judges in the course of hearing the cases um, and making decisions when the court is open. So to conclude, the parties and prote- uh, practitioners who use the UPC now have the rules of procedure necessary to bring an action in the UPC and the details of how much the fees will cost and the levels of recovery of legal representation that are possible. These pre- provide procedures on lodging a statement of claim all the way to, through to obtaining a decision, damages and costs, as well as potential preliminary and evidence finding measures. However, as I've already hinted, the rules of procedure cannot provide every detail that parties and practitioners may want to know. The rules are going to require further interpretation and clarification and application to the facts of specific cases, of course, in the months and years to come. This is going to be of particular importance to preliminary injunctions and preservation and inspection orders. Therefore, what remains now, once the court has come into, uh, court has come into force, to see how the rules of procedure apply in practice. So I should also add in closing that we'll be producing further webinars on issues raised in this overview, in particular providing a closer look at the use of evidence, experts, preservation orders, as well as appeals. So please watch out for news of the next webinar in your inbox or on our dedicated UPC web pages, the address of which is given at the top of the slide. And again, please remember uh, just to hang on and wait for the survey and please give us your feedback. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for my colleagues. Thanks to my colleagues and goodbye. <laughs>